Last class we looked into concrete transporting and mixing together with ready mixed concrete, also other modes of transportation. Continuing with the concrete production, we shall now look into pumping, placing and compaction. General outline of this uh, discussion would be, first of all we will look into pumping which is a really versatile mode of transporting and placing concrete, then we will look into placing and compaction. Let us see first what is pumping of concrete. Pumping is used for both transporting and placing of concrete. Well, this combines both vertical and horizontal transport in one. So, it is quite versatile in that sense. It can place concrete in a very congested site with little excess otherwise. And small or large quantities of concrete can be placed in the form directly continuously at a very fast rate. Okay. Now, let us see what is the basically is there any difference of the mix required for pumping? Well, that is there is the mix that we can transport through pumps requires some special properties. Ranges of pumping rate can be 10 to 75 cubic meter per hour and concrete can be pumped through a height of 90 to 300 meter horizontally. Well, vertically 30 to 90 meters, but remember both cannot be done simultaneously that is both 300 meter and 90 meter in vertical height 300 horizontal two cannot be done together. There are varieties of pumps. So, if you look at types of pumps, the first ones are the piston pumps, mechanical and hydraulic pumps. A second variety is called peristatic pumps or squeeze kit pumps. Well, same either this piston pumps, they can again be mobile boom pumps, can be trailer mounted pumps and there can be other kind of pneumatic placers of concrete. Continuing the type of pumps, this is what a piston pumps looks like. See it is a reciprocating pump as can be seen and currently this one is in its suction stroke whereby concrete is through the suction hopper concrete is concrete enters into the pump, this piston moves along this direction and you see the along the suction direction this moves like this and this valve now it is at open position whereas this valve now is at closed position. During the delivery stroke the piston moves along this direction and this valve get closed and this valve is open. So, this, this concrete as you can say it becomes horizontally aligned to the delivery pipe and concrete is delivered outward. That is how uh, piston pumps works. Okay, we continue with the type of pumps. Usually since there is a suction and delivery, the pressure onto the concrete increases and then decreases increases and decreases. So, it is sort of a sort of varying not constant. Now, to reduce this effect of suction and relaxation of the suction uh, high pressure and lesser pressure, two twin pumps can be joined together while one of the pump is in suction stroke, the other can be in the delivery stroke. And this can be hydraulically driven as well. So, you can as you can see this is hydraulically driven that you know same piston pumps, but the pistons are now driven hydraulically. So, this is in a suction stroke and the other one is in its delivery stroke. Same any one of these types of pumps can be actually mounted on a truck. So, it is a mobile boom pump. 
this is a trailer mounted pump as you can see the pump is mounted on the trailer and this is very common and usually used for large capacity pumps and that is what is mostly used currently in the country. This is another kind of pump called peristatic pumps. Now these pumps in case of these pumps you see you have a flexible hose you have a flexible hose and there is a hopper it collects the concrete this one is a rotating blades to help you know to help to help to help delivery of the concrete to the flexible hose this is a planetary system planetary drive with its central axis here these are other rotary actually rotary drives and this rotates this roller rotates about this axis this roller rotates about this axis and this two together whole thing rotates like this. This squeezes the pump pipe here the flexible hose here drives the concrete as it goes around and here the concrete is delivered under pressure. This is called squeeze crit pump. Uh, now it is used but not so much unlike the piston pumps. Okay. The pneumatic placer is used for uh, grouts usually as you can see it has got a casing this is the casing this is the inlet hopper this is a bell shaped inlet and this is air entry pipe with a nozzle this is also the nozzle and this is the delivery. The concrete is actually driven by compressed air pneumatically. So concrete enters here the pneumatic air enters here air entry D through this and then finally you know air under pressure through a compressor and then it is delivered through this usually used for grouts or relatively dry sort of mixtures. So these are the types of pumps. Now how does concrete flow in a normal pump I mean normal uh, you know delivery pipe of a pump it flows in the form of plug separated by pipe wall by a layer of lubricating layer as you can see and no relative velocity between aggregate particle for a straight pipe of constant cross section exists. Lubrication lubricating layer near pipe boundary is essential for pumpability you see the concrete pumping concrete is generally a material which has got lot of solids it is not like liquid or like any other fluid so that it can flow easily on its own. Now the material that can flow in concrete is basically water. So you make a plastic mixer uh, mix out of the solid materials solid ingredients and the water. Now this water should with the very fine material forms a slurry and this slurry is you know forms a lubricating layer at the boundary of the pipe and through this lubricating layer concrete is actually moved under pressure in, in the case of pumping. Okay. There are some compacting effect on the concrete also because you apply a pressure and then this is also released as it moves because as I said the pressure is not a constant pressure it increases during the delivery stroke and then reduces a little bit and therefore it gets compressed a little bit and this pressure also force, forces little bit of grout to come out and get accumulated at the pipe boundary. There is something called a traveling effect if you travel a concrete surface you will see that water and the slurry tends to come up. So this traveling effect also takes place due to frictional drag at the boundary. So at the boundary a lubricating layer is formed that is what is being said in totality. Uh, now the flow would look like this plug flow as we call it you see you have a fine lubricating layer at the boundary fine lubricating layer this is the plug you know complete plug which is solid and this lubricating thin layer the velocity gradient exists here and for this whole plug the velocity is constant. So velocity profile if you look at it is constant throughout and here there is a variation of velocity 0 at the boundary and there is an increase. So this is what uh, we call it plug flow. Now this is facilitated when concrete is what is called saturated. What is the state of saturation? When mortar in concrete has got sufficient water and uh, uh, that can fill all the voids in the mortar system 
and the mortar itself fills all the aggregates and slightly more maybe and the system is such that it can create you know sufficient cement paste in the uh, mortar system again and sufficient water in the cement paste itself such that a uh, lubricating layer can be formed concrete is said to be saturated. In saturated concrete radial and axial pressure both are same and this is fine con content is very important because it must form sufficient amount of mortar. If you have excess of fine then there is a little bit of problem because too much of cohesiveness due to this excess of fines or cements you know fines include cements also because we are talking of the particles here. Uh, this can actually prevent formation of lubricating layer. So, pumpability is governed by what? Lubricating layer must be formed. The saturated concrete is easy to pump and early experiment done in 1950s have shown that water to cement or rather you can say fines ratio, the fines may include today including fly ash and other materials which I mentioned which are cementitious or very fine in nature, you know total powder very fine powders. So, water to cement ratio or water to powder ratio you can call in today's terminology. When it increases beyond a point that means you have sufficient amount of fines such that the fine holds on to the water, water cannot flow on its own. It is actually sort of trapped by the solid system the very fine particulate system. So, you have sufficient amount of fine such that water cannot move through the interstitial pores of the fines and it is held together. So, this is said that water to cement ratio or water to fine you know fine water to very fine powder ratio when this is high there is sufficient amount of water it can be saturated. So, this zone one can say you can say you can see that this zone is the unsaturated zone and this zone is a saturated zone transition from unsaturated to saturated and this is the saturated zone where you have sufficient amount of water and overall there must be sufficient amount of fines in the system. The next diagram will make it clear a little bit. You see you can see that when the total void content in the system versus cement content we plot void content in means in the void content in the aggregate system overall and the cement content if you see if you have high voids there will be segregation because water will just move away leaving the solids. So, the tendency to segregate or bleed when you have high voids in the medium you have less amount of fines. On the other hand if you have too much of fine there will be high resistance to flow because too much of cohesiveness is there. In between this is marginal this is marginal but most easily pumpable readily pumpable situation is this. So, when you have sufficient amount of fines such that voids are least, but at the same time fines are not too much to create high resistance to flow pumpability is possible. So, quant quantity of fines are very important fines here we mean the cement if you have added fly ash of course them also possibly very fine sand or the fine aggregate below say 150 micron those are important. So, that is what makes concrete pumpable. Well, pumpability of course, we measure as we shall see later on in one of our discussion that uh, um, slump is a measure of flowability of concrete or workability of concrete as the terminology goes. Uh, pumpability is also a function of workability. It can be crudely related to workability that is slump here. So, slump here. So, very high slump concrete is pumpable. Now, as you can see the slump actually well slump actually increases along this direction slump increases on in this direction it is 3 centimeter to 13 centimeter means 130 millimeter and the flow resistance reduces. So, as I increase the slump flow resist flow resistance reduces that means it becomes easily pumpable. So, roughly speaking loosely speaking you can say a uh, slump of 120, 130, 150 these are all pumpable mixes. So, that is crude way of looking at it, but of course the mechanics is not really 100 percent understand understood till date. So, we use a very high slump for pumpability right. What happens if we pump the concrete is there any effect on concrete? well practically there is no negative effect. It becomes makes it a little bit drier after all you are applying pressure to the concrete then increase the temperature slightly. 
air content in the concrete may increase very little and as far as strength, shrinkage etcetera are concerned there is no negative effect, no reduction in strength, no, no increase in shrinkage takes place. Well, aluminum pipes otherwise also is problematic as far as concrete is concerned because aluminum, aluminum can react with some component of the cement. Okay. So, this can really cause reduction. All right. Some do's and do. So, that is all about pumping some do's and do not as far as uh, um, concrete handling is concerned we shall look into we shall look into some do's and do not uh, as far as concrete handling is concerned. Now, this is you see when you are discharging concrete the concrete should be discharged in single go right single go whole mix whole discharge from the single mix should be discharged on a wheelbarrow and not part by part. What happens when you are mixing concrete and you are discharging to the uh, delivery shoot of the mixture initially the stones have a tendency to fall onto the wheelbarrow and then later on it will be less stony mesh. So, as you can see here the stony batch is there less stony material is here. So, it should be actually transported in one go loaded into the wheelbarrow in one go all right. Similarly, should should not be like this delivery should not be like this if it is like this what will happen is the stones will have a tendency to get accumulated here and the the rich mortar would have a tendency or cement more more enough with fine materials flowable materials the stones will try to accumulate here rest of the material will try to accumulate here. Similarly, is the case when this is very angle is very large on the other hand if it is a bottom opening discharge bottom opening discharge or it is a smooth shoot you will find there is a you know it is to the right from the bottom then this problem does not occur because then everything goes together. But if you have a large inclination then large coarse aggregate has a tendency to go further away whereas the slurry of mortar will flow this way. So, bottom open bucket should preferably be used this is the correct mode similarly this is the correct mode right the tapered bottom opening bucket all right not like this because this will again tendency to aggregate large stone aggregates to come here and fine aggregates to you know move or if it is too narrow or too narrow like this if it is too narrow like this or too narrow like this what will happen is only the fine material or slurry material the mortar would come down but the stones would remain there they will get stuck there. So, initially all mortars will come and then next the stones would come. So, in this process what will happen the uniformity of a concrete is lost this is to be taken care of while handling concrete. Similarly, if it is through a if it is through a conveyor belt you see the series of shoots are used hoppers and shoots are used in order to see that concrete is remains uniform after discharge. Whereas, if you just drop it what will happen the large aggregate will come here mortar will only reach there stones will reach there. So, these are some tips one should use while actually handling concrete. Right. Now, next look to the next phase of production of concrete. So, we have seen so far that we have actually batched the concrete, mixed the concrete and then transported it by various kind of means that is possible we have talked about. And now, let us look into next phase of our uh, production process that is called compaction. And this compaction we do usually by vibration okay but not in all cases the special cases will come this is required because placed concrete so you place through whatever means normal concrete will contain large amount of voids as much as 30% and of course you don't place exactly into the shape unless highly flowable concrete that's a different issue altogether otherwise uh, you have to move the concrete a little bit to get to get to the get the right kind of shape and that is also done by vibration or compaction process. So, compaction therefore, is required to drive the air out of concrete in other words to densify it right and also it causes movement of the concrete a little bit to exactly match with the shape of the foam all right ensures improvement in homogeneity also uniformity of the concrete. 
Now, this compaction is normally achieved through vibration. Now, a special case which I think I might have mentioned earlier sometime, something called self compacting concrete and it does not need any vibration. The name itself suggests there is self compacting in the uh, initial performance of concrete when we define performance concrete we set performance in the early stage. A self compacting concrete has got a very high performance in the early stage so much so that it does not require any compaction. So, such a concrete of course would not require vibration. You know, basic idea is to do away with the vibration with this particular concrete. So, we are not talking of that concrete at the moment, we are talking of the normal concrete which requires vibration. Well, uh, this energy of vibration or this energy for driving out uh, the air or for the purpose of compaction is we supply it through oscillatory, mo oscillatory motion of the vibration right which is nearly simple harmonic motion simple harmonic motion this is generated by rotating eccentric having a frequency and amplitude of vibration so generally a rotating eccentric as we shall see and the frequency can easily be measured in air we can measure the frequency in air but it is difficult to measure the frequency in within concrete although it's actually more relevant it's more relevant to measure within concrete but uh, that's difficult to measure Let us see what are the types of vibrators. There is something called internal vibrators, the most popular ones and many of you might have seen it if you have seen a construction site. Usually there are two types, flexible shaft type which are the most common type and electric motor in hand type. Then there are air vibrators, that is again internal vibrators, air vibrators, form vibrators those vibrates the form itself. Then vibrating table, surface vibrators. So, let us see one by one, first we will look into internal vibrators, continue with the type of vibrators. These are called immersion, submersible, poker or spark type vibrator. They are either called immersion, submersible, poker, spark type. This is first one is a flexible shaft vibrator and the other is a motor in head. Now, you can see this diagram, this is the flexible drive type and this is motor in head itself, this is a right. So, this has got a flexible hose, flexible hose right, that is a flexible shaft, usually it is a spring and this is the mass, rotating mass eccentric which looks like this, you see which shape is like this, you have got excess mass here. So, it is an eccentric shaft and these are the bearings. So, the spring that is a flexible uh, shaft, flexible shaft which is usually a spring which rotates causes rotation of this one. Since this is eccentric, this generates a kind of uh, oscillatory motion during its rotation, during its rotation. Similarly, you can have something like a pendulum shaft. So, you have a shaft again the, uh, the flexible shaft you know is here the spring that rotates from the motor a prime mover a motor electric motor usually or a diesel motor would cause rotation of this shaft and this finally cause rotation of this pendulum shaft and it has got this eccentric mass here. So, this ones, this both of this, this is a flexible shaft type. The other is an electrical cable comes here and there is a motor here, eccentric shaft is here, there is a bearing and there is electric or pneumatic motor here which causes rotation of this one and uh, due to this eccentric and the rotation of this eccentric it imparts a kind of oscillatory, oscillatory, oscillatory motion through the surface of the surface of the vibrator, surface of the uh, poker vibrator to the concrete in the surrounding. This is the air vibrator. In this case, see air comes through this, yeah, well one is the casing as you can see two is the plunger. So, this is the plunger which moves this way, three is the distribution box through which air compressed air can move like this it is applying pressure on this side and the excess pressure that has gone out earlier would come out through this. The compressed air causes this plunger to move to from one side to the other you know 25 millimeter to about 150 millimeter diameter this one is and it moves to and fro you know moves the plunger from one side to the other and imparting 
oscillatory motion to the concrete in the surrounding. So, this diagram shows the air vibrator, not so common, but the previous ones were more common, particularly the flexible shaft type. Yeah, this is the most common and its diameter ranges from 20 to 180 millimeter, usually generated by means of rotating eccentric having a frequency and amplitude of vibration that we have mentioned and the frequency can be okay, this we have already said right and uh, uh, more about this we will have in a table. So, this immersion vibrator usually if you see if the head diameter is between 20 to 40, recommended frequency is 10 to 15 cycle per minute. Average amplitude is of the order of 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 millimeter. Radius of action is about 8 to 15 centimeter. So, uh, you know it, it can operate, it can vibrate the concrete within a radius of between this range and compressive uh, the compaction rate is about 0 0.8 to 0 0.4 uh, centimeter uh, per hour. This is applied in case of plastic concrete thin sections and uh, you know plastic concrete thin sections actually this will be applied in section where there is very thin section a lot of reinforcement is there. So, that is where you will apply this particular uh, one right. 30 to 60 millimeter this recommended frequency is like this average amplitude is of this kind radius of action is so much and uh, compaction rate is given by this wall column beam and if you see the last end you know larger side these are usually used for mass concrete in dams because there are no reinforcement where you have congested reinforcement you would possibly go for this sort of thing very thin wave let us say wave of a wave of a box box section you know wave of a box section a vertical member vertical wall very thin 150 millimeter or about 200 millimeter in thickness and you have got reinforcement cage on both sides and also let us say a pre-stressing cable is passing through this now it's very difficult to vibrate this using a poker vibrator of large diameter you can use this vibrator of the smaller diameter. Of course, you have other means of vibrating them also, but if you are using uh, this immersion vibrator, this is a kind of suggested uh, range given. Okay. The other variety is the foam vibrator. Now, these are used, these are actually external vibrators and these transmit pulses both in plane and perpendicular to the form work. In other words, you place it onto the form itself you place it onto the form itself and it vibrates the form and when it vibrates the form in turn the vibration of the form is transmitted to the concrete and causes concrete to vibrate. Naturally some amount of energy is lost in the process because you are vibrating the form also right. So, uh, some amount, amount of energy is lost, but where you cannot actually vibrate with the uh, poker vibrator the needle vibrator form vibrator is the only solution because if you have too large amount of reinforcement then it would be difficult to vibrate with needle vibrator. So, form vibrator could be another solution. Well, its acceleration is 1 g to 3 g for adequate amplitude. Uh, both rotary and reciprocating types are used and can they can either be electrically driven or pneumatically driven right. You can see that 3000 to 6000 rpm, 6000 to 1200 um, cycles per minute or rpm you can say is, a, is, a, is you know. So, pneumatically ones uses larger cycles per minute right. Reciprocating type accelerates in a given direction and imparts impact causing vibration. So, basically it imparts an impact and as I said it is both plane in plane that is along the plane of the shuttering and also transverse direction uh, vibration is imparted onto the concrete. So, it vibrates you know transverse both both impact energy is transmitted horizontally uh, also vertically along the plane of the formwork and also to the concrete directly. Reciprocating vibrators are usually pneumatically driven. I mentioned earlier frequencies are in the range of 1000 to 5000 cycles per minute. These are mostly perpendicular to the form, the impulses are mostly perpendicular to the form. Vibrating table, so 
form vibrator we have discussed, we have discussed internal vibrator or needle vibrator. The other type of vibrator is a vibrating table. Vibrating tables are usually used for precast elements like uh, you might have seen if you have gone to a laboratory where concrete cubes are cast for testing purposes. There these are vibrated on a table. So table vibrators are done used for only for precast elements because large slab, uh, slab precast slabs, we will discuss what is precast uh, later on. So precast slabs or precast members they can be vibrated on vibrating table, not very large, not very large but small ones. So uh, the frequency is usually less than 6,000 6, vibration per minute and amplitude is greater than 0.12 millimeter. So this is table platform is vibrated and you put your molds with the concrete there and it gets vibrated. The other kind of vibrators are the surface vibrators which exerts their vibrator you know exerts their effects at top surface of the concrete. Now this is only useful for slab cannot be used for any other kind of any other kind of uh, um, any other kind of uh, 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 element concrete element. So this one includes vibrating screed pan type vibrator, vibrating roller skid, vibrating plate and vibratory roller for pavement concrete. So these are, these are the kind of vibrators, uh, surface vibrators. Right. Form vibrators are used where it is imp impractical to use internal vibrators. I have already mentioned this. Screeds are used in thin slabs. So because you can put it onto the surface and vibrate it, we have floors, you know flooring. High frequency and low amplitude vibration generally results in more efficient compaction. So high frequency, low amplitude that is the idea. Now let us see what happens when we subject fresh concrete, you know, to vibration. Before compaction it is a mass of particles essentially, you know if you have essentially particulate system something like this heap of particle, heap of particle of various sizes just there you know supported one after one over another sort of an arching action it supports itself like soil you know it is like soil. Uh, which you can have a heap of soil. So it is like that concrete masses. So these are particles separated and coated with mortar held in a pile and that is called arching action of the coarser particle. The coarse particle will hold on to the finer particle and so on. Right. This arching is the result of friction between aggregate particles, surface tension and cohesive forces of the cement paste. Okay. In case of soil of course it will not be that if it is particularly quartz particle alone say quartz stones that would be simply the friction. But in this case the cohesion of the cement paste also comes into picture because it can bond in its plastic state also it can hold it by cohesion. Then surface tension since there is some liquid the water is in, involved so the surface tension all these forces interface between liquid and solid is there. So all these forces actually holds this mass into position. Now this mass will have some interstitial voids in them as I showed you a little bit earlier. This voids by due to this arching are filled up with air as much as 30 percent. When you sub supply vibratory impulse you know this liquefies the motor this liquefies the mortar portion of the concrete and reduces the internal friction. Basically what is happening is you know you are supplying impulse and the mortar uh, now on the move and can results in it reduces down the internal friction and therefore it does what is called liquefaction of this mortar and thereby further you know causes consolidation of the force of by due to the force of gravity. So when you are actually physically you can understand when you are vibrating it like this the internal friction between this particle system would actually will overcome this internal friction and the particle will try to settle down on the on its own weight. So by gravity that is what is being said right and there when it settles down the cohesion between the particle is re-established the bond between the cement coated material you know between various types of cement coated materials together that is actually is re-established and then they 
become a solid material there and strength increases. The velocity of compression waves generated is something like 45 meter per second in the beginning of vibration and increases to 240 meter per second at the end. This is because you have voids, so velocity initially is less. As the voids get reduced, the velocity increases to 240 meter per second, 240 meter per second, you know, nearly going towards the velocity of uh, mechanical waves. For 200 hertz, this velocity is corresponds to 0.2 meter and 1.2 meter wavelength because the velocity is known and you know v equals to f lambda. So, if you know the frequency 200 hertz corresponding wavelengths you can find out. This waves actually causes movement of water more than the solid particles and if water is stepped into the pore or interstitial pores of the system. So, this will cause lot of movement of the water. So, there will be excess pressure within this pores which results in breakage of this you know hydraulic pressure within this interstitial space and causes its breakage. The pressure where in is maximum in constricted pores and causes it causes breakage of that uh, interstitial pore system itself and reduces down the friction. So, it gives concrete a temporary fluidity, it gives concrete a temp you know I mean uh, the paste in the concrete a temporary fluidity and there is a mechanism how this compaction results in. Uh, results from vibration. This is easily understood, one can do what is known as box shear test, okay. An early work done in box shear test, you know here what is done is you have a concrete here and you have concrete here, these are all fresh concrete, you know sort of fresh just after mixing water, it is not solidified. So, you apply pressure here, I mean force here and force here, the shear force here within two boxes, this is the box mold, it is usually done for soil. So, very those who have done a course in soil would understand this box shear test is very often done for soil. And then this is another box, so you pull them off this two separate boxes actually, this is one box and the top box and concrete you fill in and then you pull them off, but apply a pressure, vertical pressure. So, as you increase the vertical pressure sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3, the shear force it can withstand is higher and uh, uh, shear strain increases, you know, with the increase in shear strain, something like this. This sort of behavior is observed. So, with increase in sigma tau, maximum tau it can withstand increases. You can understand, even you are putting pressure like this, if you are trying to pull them, it would be, uh, it would be difficult to pull it. You know, higher the pressure, more difficult it would be pulled. So, that is why this yield shear strength increases or maximum shear strength increases. Right, but what happens if I am vibrating? It has been observed when you are vibrating, when the vibratory force is more than the normal force, this sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3, the tau values reduces down significantly, where the tau values were much higher before vibration and while you are vibrating, if the vibrating force is more than the normal pressure, then this increases, you know this shear strength reduces significantly. This diagram also again shows the same thing. Uh, if I plot the normal stress versus shear strength, as I said, as I increase the normal strength, normal uh, normal uh, stress, you know, the pressure pressure that I applied from top, this will be the behavior prior to any vibration. This is the, the behavior prior to any vibration. As I increase the normal stress, the shear strength or the maximum shear it can withstand will increase. That is what we have seen in the earlier diagram. But during vibration what happens is, this is the path followed. So, normally if the normal stress as the as the you know as the uh, the shear strength is very low, so long as the normal stress is not greater than the vibrating force or equivalent vibrating stress. So, so long as the equivalent vibrating stress is lower than the normal stress, you know you find that the shear strength is very, very low. But once this normal stress increases beyond the vibrating force, this path so, by applying vibration actually shear strength is reduced significantly, thereby it can collapse, it can move, it can collapse, there is of course the viscosity, dynamic viscosity also changes, one can look into those issues, but we are not into the details, but the point that I am trying to make is simply that when you apply vibration, its strength reduces. So, therefore, it there is a liquefaction which takes place and it can move very easily and get into the new shape, get, get a new shape and get compacted in the process. So, after vibration if you try to do the shear box shear test again, you find that the as the normal stress 
you increase the strength shear strength increases significantly because now it is all compact the cohesion has been re-established and this is how it behaves. So this is what is a you know principle of uh, compaction through vibration. It takes place in two stages compaction takes place in two stages. In the first stage vertical settlement of coarse aggregate takes place in a manner similar to packing of granular material and shape of the aggregate plays a major role air voids up to 5 percent remains after this stage. So what happens is actually the granular material will collapse they will they will you know on their own weight they will move and take the new positions. So this is the first stage this is the first stage right. So it is like like all granular material at that moment they are not bonded strongly because the, although some cohesive forces are there because you do before the uh, material has become solid it is still in plastic state compaction is all done till it is in plastic state. So uh, basically the particulate system they are not bonded. So when you apply vibration they would move out and try to settle try to settle onto uh, new positions and then of course the cohesion increases. So by this process actually 5 percent the voids is reduced up to about 5 percent that is the first stage. In the second stage concrete behaves like dense liquid now there are some 5 percent voids are there and it behaves like a dense liquid right. And air voids are removed from the surface by forcing mortar, mortar to appear at the surface. So what will happen now you have the solids have gone and settled and still 5 percent voids are there now it is almost like dense liquid. So as you vibrate the mortar would tend to come out mortar would tend to come out through the interstitial space between the coarse aggregate and as it appears at the top the air also comes out. So air also gets you know it moves out so that is the second stage of the vibration. In fact one of the ways of uh, you know assuming whether concrete has really attained vibration or not to find out the slurry the mortar slurry or the slurry has come out right at the top there is a liquid sort of a layer at the top that ensures the vibration has become complete. One way is to measure through unit weight right various density gauges can be used for this purpose. So if you look at uh, unit weight time of vibration along this direction unit weight along this direction as you increase if you vibrate for certain period of time the density increases but beyond a point of course there is no increase. So there is no point over vibrating the system it does not give you any benefit because uh, long term vibration essentially would not make the concrete any more compact. So it is not worthwhile doing long term vibration there is a minimum time and that should be done. Some do's and do ts in case of concrete vibration you see this is correct way of doing this is not the correct inclined way to lift concrete up is not desirable by vibration. This is not the right way to do vertically this is what is done and it is lifted up as soon as the slurry has come out to the top right. So this is what it is if you are concreting at the uh, concreting at the you know concreting in an inclined concreting in an inclined. So this is uh, uh, immersion type of vibrator you know it is preferable to uh, vibrate I mean place concrete from bottom and uh, vibrate it in this manner as shown right. Concrete shall not be moved using internal vibrators this can result in segregation this can result in segregation that is if you try to move too much uh, the coarser particle and rest of the mortar they may not go together. So that is results in segregation so therefore you should place it as close as possible to the place where you expect the concrete to remain finally. But slight movement is not avoidable because as I mentioned earlier the concrete seldom attains the shape you want it to attain because it would be in a form of a heap of a solid and then you vibrate it to attain the right kind of shape desirable shape. Well this is while executing vibration the needle vibrators are penetrated vertically to sufficiently embed into the concrete then held stationary and then remove slowly at a speed of about 77.5 centimeter per second. So that would be the uh, best way of vibration.
you have to ensure a regular spacing that compaction of all portion if required there can be adequate overlap you know I can show you diagrammatically something like this say if this is your needle position and this is the radius of operation then next needle position should be something like this such that there is a mild overlap small overlap this is just a radius and for example if you do it like this with the radius here this portion is you know this portion will remain unvibrated. So to ensure complete vibration it should be something like this it should be preferably something like this so that there is a overlap sufficient amount of overlap right such that no portion in a section remains unvibrated okay. So it should be at regular spacing to ensure compaction of all portion and with overlap there is no problem if there is a little bit of overlap but no portion should be left unvibrated that is important. Ten seconds is necessary minimum there are formulas available several formulas available I I think I have not uh, got those formulas basically because there is no point having empirical formulas but literature gives you a large number of formulas most of them are empirical there are ways of measuring this appropriate uh, time required for vibration also uh, empirical uh, formulas are available and uh, minimum one for a for the first level of the idea one must remember that minimum of about 10 seconds are necessary for vibrations and vibration should be stopped when the slurry has come up to the top slowly it is to be lifted up a recommended velocity been mentioned 7.5 centimeter per second at that rate perhaps you lift it up and when you lift up the slurry should come right up to the top ensuring that actually the last you know last portion of the air has also been removed from the concrete. For form vibrators fastening with the form is very very important vibration time is about uh, 2 minutes to about 30 minutes depending upon concrete and the vibrator. So here you require longer vibration longer period of vibration depending upon of course the situation but it should be firmly held in position because if it is not firm then there will be some energy loss at the junction also. So it has to be firmly fixed to the formwork itself. A vibrating screed which is used for floors essentially you know surface vibrator uh, to remove the air from there usually needs about two passes. So you have two passes and then it vibrates from the top uh, to remove the air voids at least two passes are needed. Well, um, this diagram shows the degree of vibration that is achieved by the surface vibrator. Now as you can see this is the top. So density of the concrete is maximum somewhere here. Uh, this is unit weight 140 pound you know cubic feet etc etc also given in kg per meter cube to uh, kg per uh, you know unit weight in terms of kg per meter cube 2.2 or something like that whatever it is into 10 to the power 3. So 2200 or 300 nearly about that compaction you achieve at a depth of this much as a depth of this much and as you go down below practically the unit weight reduces and very small unit weight. So you see the surface vibrators are effective only up to certain depth not to the fullest extent right. So it's, it shows how the surface vibrator. So in a deep section there is no point because surface vibrators will not be uh, effective but in a thin section yes thin section it is quite effective as you can see right. So like this is 2 inch this is 4 inch so about 100 millimeter corresponding to this is 100 millimeter this is 150 millimeter. So if you were very large thick section surface vibrators are not useful but they are good when you have thin sections and when you cannot use needle vibrator. In case of, of course large mass concrete we have seen that I can use 180 millimeter diameter needle vibrator. So in thin section lot of reinforcement maybe this will be useful right. This table shows the imperfect, imperfect, imperfections possible in vibrators vibrations. If you do not do proper vibrations it can result in what is known as honeycombing 
you know concrete looks like honeycomb. So, there are a lot of lot of gaps in the concrete system. Uh, looks like stony and large air voids. So, stone should be uh, visible and a lot of air voids can possibly take place in narrow section. It also depends upon form condition right. So, uh, there could be if there is some grout loss then the stones will remain and therefore, honeycombing is possible. So, uh, if you have a free fall more than 2 meter height or you know there is a large free fall low some concrete. So, stones remains the mortar is not there this can result in honeycombing. As far as compaction is concerned poor compaction can result in honeycombing. This is usually the result of poor vibration in narrow areas where concrete cannot reach vibrator cannot reach you might see this. There is something called bug holes or blow holes which are quite common in case of surfaces. You see what happens is air get air or water gets trapped at the mold surface and most of the concretes many a concretes you would see would actually will have some sort of bug holes small holes at the surface of the concrete. So, those are called bug holes right and uh, if you have used excess shattering oil this can result in formation of this bug hole. In a low slump low cement or lean concrete this can happen and this can also result from inadequate vibration not for poor, but inadequate vibrations. If you vibrate it fully some of this air get driven out, but there are other means of actually getting rid of this getting a better aesthetically pleasant uh, surface of concrete without bug holes other means also, but uh, generally if you want to reduce it adequate vibration ensures that the fine particles slurries etcetera move in there and resulting in reduction in this bug holes. A poor inadequate compaction can result in this in addition to of course, you know excess oil and so on. Subsidence and cracking short crack formation can take place these are called sometimes this plastic settlement can take place. Well, let me just show you what this could be. For example, it could be something like this it could be something like this you know this is your concrete surface and let us say you have a reinforcement here this is the reinforcement this is the reinforcement. Now, concrete settles with time because the water will come out and the solids will have subsidence of the solid will take place solid tends to go down you know water is the least specific gravity amongst all the materials that you put in concrete water has got a specific gravity of 1 whereas, cement has got a specific gravity of 3.15 aggregates will be 2.6 etcetera etcetera you know. So, water is the least specific gravity material it will have a tendency to come up. So, as it comes up the solids actually settles down cement will have a tendency to go down more aggregates will have a tendency to go down below. So, as a result concrete subsides subsidence takes place you know subsidence takes place. Now, when this is taking place this concrete will go down straight this concrete will go down straight, but what about this concrete here it will get stuck here. So, as it gets stuck it can result in formation of crack short crack at the surface you know short crack like this it might look like crack like might look this this is your reinforcement or large aggregate this is your concrete top surface this sort of uh, crack formation can take place. Now, this is called plastic settlement this can happen when you have high water content high water content and also from inadequate compaction. If the compaction is proper the subsidence would have taken place right in the beginning itself water would have come out. So, this will you know other other causes are also there, but inadequate compaction can also help in formation of this sort of cracks which are not desirable. So, adequate comp compaction is a necessity. Well, form offset you can have irregular surface that is the form work not you know not uh, not proper it is it has got some sort of offset weak form during vibration it has moved out the form work it is bold to have come out or something like this. So, non uniform actually it will result in non uniform uh, vibration actually cold joint this happens when you have old concrete and new concrete you are trying to uh, make or the concrete just you have placed and then you are placing the new concrete you have not the vibrator has not gone into the old concrete. So, it, it will form two separate layers as a kind of discontinuity this could be from poor planning because one concrete you have made you have waited too long it has set and then you have placed the next concrete. So, can result in poor planning delayed placing that is what it is and inadequate embedment of the needle vibrator to the previous layer can result in the same sort of 
same sort of cold joint formation. So, this you know many other things causes some of these defects, but compaction can be also an additional factor to result in things like honeycombing or for that matter bug holes, subsidence or plastic cracking etcetera, plastic settlement or cold joint formation. So, importance of uh, compaction is actually um, shown by this right. Right. So, let us go back. and see uh, something about special vibrations. Sometime I may do revibrations, but so long my needle can penetrate into the concrete revibration is okay. There is no problem, my needle must sink into the concrete, right. Okay. This corresponds to a penetration resistance of 3.5 MPa. Now, penetration resistance is a test for measurement of concrete setting. If the resistance is high, that means it has already solidified from plastic to the solid state it has gone. So long it is less than 3.5 MPa uh, penetration resistance, that means the needle vibrator can penetrate easily, you can still vibrate it, right. Okay. It can increase the strength bond, increase the bond strength, it can improve imper impermeability and shrinkage and creep, it would reduce. Vacuum vibration is a special kind of vibration accomplished by ap applying vacuum to surface fresh concrete. Cement paste is densified by removal of air from the surface and water from certain depth. This is some special vibration. So, I think we will come to the nearly now come to the end of it. What we have done? We have seen pumping and some issues related to placing. We have seen that pumping is really versatile. It can transport the concrete horizontally as well as vertically. You can transport the pump itself, therefore it can go to any place in other otherwise congested site, you can place the concrete very easily. So, it can transport and place, transport both horizontally as well as vertically, but you got to actually uh, modify your concrete a little bit with appropriate amount of fines and possibly right kind of slump at the moment that is uh, that would be sufficient for our understanding. Placings we have seen, placing should be done in such a manner that there is no segregation. And then we have looked into compaction, which means densifying the concrete, driving out the air voids, the mechanism of compaction and finally, what would happen if you have not done proper compaction. I think that is the end of this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you for patient hearing.